Hey everybody, welcome to the recording studios in St. Paul for AP Art History. Uh, it's a little bit later than usual when I do these uh, lectures. Uh, it's around 7.30, uh, but that's okay. All right, so we are moving into uh, African art. We are done with American art for quite a long time. Um, and uh, before you on the screen is my former professor, uh, Ray Silverman at Michigan State University. Uh, you guys don't, I don't think you guys don't know this. Uh, I, in another life, um, was in grad school for international relations history, but I spent a lot of time focusing in on African history and art history. And Ray Silverman was my um, professor in a graduate class on Ethiopian art, uh, which was very difficult. I won't get into it, but it was. Uh, and then he let me audit um, his uh, undergrad class uh, in just kind of like an introduction to uh, African art history. And uh, the reason why I'm showing you him is because uh, he came up with this idea that I've been using for probably Oh, I don't know, 28 years of my teaching, and that is art by destination and art by metamorphosis. And uh, <clears throat> so it's his idea, not mine for sure, but I've always been a promoter of it. He now is a professor at um, the University of Michigan, um, and uh, he's still going strong from what I know. Okay, so his idea is that an object like this, uh, which is from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which is, I believe, is still the largest uh, country in Africa, it's huge, um, <clears throat> it's a headrest in the form of a human figure. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but when I look at these, I think to myself, "Wow, oh, that just, I couldn't put my neck on top of that <laughs> um and get any good rest um but uh so it's uh from the luba people and there are various different um indigenous <coughs> tribes in the democratic republic of the congo uh and the luba are one of them and um what he is saying mr uh professor ray silverman is that this is an example of art by metamorphosis that when it was made, it had a function uh, in within the Luba people, um, and the function was to use this to sleep with at night, and it wasn't uh, <clears throat> considered to be art with a big A R T until uh, it was probably stolen. Let's be honest, um, and then put into a. Uh, Western Art Museum. I think this one is actually from the National Museum of African Art in DC, which is one of my favorite museums. Um, put under lights, put under glass, and contemplated um, as art. Um, so there's a metamorphosis that it's an object is taken out of its culture. It's not necessarily defined as art, uh, but then once it's in a new context and a new culture, it is considered art. Now, I'm not saying that uh, the artisan who made this really beautiful, it's in essence a sculpture, if you're looking at it from the metamorphosis point of view, um, didn't make aesthetic decisions and wouldn't have been um, uh, beloved uh, for their abilities, artistic abilities. I'm just saying that in the culture itself, it had a different function. There you go. That's in essence what art by metamorphosis is about. And then here is another one. The reason why I'm showing you two of these is because it's from another people uh, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and it has a different aesthetic to it, um, which I always find super fascinating. Um, that it's the same. It has the same function in this particular people's culture, and I think it's pronounced Mabola. Um, but the shape of the figure is different, um, but it still, again, is a headrest. Um, and yeah, so there you go. Now, if you were in college next year or in two years, uh, generally you're not going to take an African art history class until probably your sophomore or junior year. Um, you would take a introductory course, which is what my class basically is. 
in your freshman year and then get into, you know, specifically sometimes a continent, um, sometimes a geographic area of study. Um, I took an African history class in undergrad, but I did not have an African art history class. I wonder if there was even one um, um, for the offering. I don't think there was. Okay, now let's go to Ethiopia. Uh, and the Amhara people, there's three main indigenous groups within Ethiopia, and the Amhara is one that a lot of people know of. And this is a fly whisk. <laughs> um, it's quite beautiful. Um, and uh, you can see that there were aesthetic choices made in the handle. Um, and uh, so this is a great example. So you would see something like this um in a museum of art uh probably an encyclopedic museum like the minneapolis institute of arts or the met um and it would be under glass <clears throat> under lights and uh, uh definitely you look at it and say that is a work of art um, whereas probably uh the people that actually use this used it to uh have flies go away from them all right Let's keep going. Um, so what's the other one? Art by destination. I'm going to get to that a little bit later, but I'll just say art by destination is when something is created and the person sees it being um, a piece of art from the very beginning um, and expects it to be um, shown in a gallery or a museum. Um, and we will see some examples of that at some point. Uh, we'll definitely see it on the EMAC um, on Friday. Um, yeah, So, and what's great is, is that over the last 10 years, there's been a huge interest in contemporary African art coming out of the continent, um, and uh, people are just loving it on the art market. Um, all right. So now let's just do a general sort of discussion about what we're going to see from the continent. Um, and first thing that I want you to know about is that there's not going to be huge monumental sculptures like these sculptures on Easter Island from the 15th century. Um, you're not going to see monumental sculptures uh, in Africa. Um, and I've had a professor talk about sort of how um, there's kind of a toolkit um which involves climactic zones that that artists um draw from and e with with the geography of africa you either have the sahara right um where everything is so dry or down below the sub-saharan area is uh very wet with rainforests um and thinking about cameroon uh my first year of teaching i taught a cameroonian girl in seventh grade anyways so uh yeah now that's not to say that the continent doesn't have great examples of incredible small wooden sculptures and we'll see some of those today but if you're looking for monumental sculptures you're not going to find them except for of course in ancient egypt um there you go all right this is one of my favorite uh tribes uh and it's from cote d'ivory um, which when it was, um, uh, and it's obviously it was, um, controlled by the French, uh, and this is the Bali people, um, and this is a male diviner figure, um, from the 19th century. Now let's get into that question of why we don't <clears throat> generally see a lot of realistic sculptures in Africa and, uh, of course, somebody from a racist point of view would say, well, they didn't have the ability to do it. And, and that's not true. In fact, I think today we're going to see some examples of very carefully wrought um, realistic sculptures from West Africa. Um, it's it it's really comes down to a choice. They, uh, talking in broad terms, of course, uh, particularly with West African uh, examples, uh, decided not to have it be realistic. Um, and, uh, yeah, so there you go. All right. Um, now we're going to go to this one. Um, and this is in the Art Institute of Chicago. It's huge. 
well, relatively huge. Um, and uh, now we need to talk a little bit about the three worlds of African man, woman. And those are uh, concrete reality, um, the community, um, and the metaphysical world or the spiritual world. And now I'm talking about traditional African cultures. Um, like anywhere in the world, of course, <clears throat> as time marches on, uh, contemporary African cultures uh, have become um, less traditional, um, less religious, so on and so forth. Uh, but so basically, from here on out, we're going to be talking about traditional uh, cultures. And so one way that I kind of explain the difference between perhaps the Western world and the traditional African world is that let's say that I came into class <clears throat> and said, well, I just had a great conversation with my grandmother. And somebody raised their hand and said, well, Craig, uh, how old is your grandmother? And I would say, oh, she died in 1987. Um, and then you would say, wow, okay. And maybe go down to Khan and ask him to come up and uh, maybe have the nurse um, <laughs> um, uh, have some sort of examination. Um, and so <clears throat> we, since the Enlightenment at least, I mean, I'm making broad general sort of statements here, um, don't think that God or gods have an impact on our daily lives. Um, we live in a world of concrete reality. Um, and so in the traditional African cultures, um, that is not true. Um, they believe that the spiritual world um, is a part of their everyday existence and that they sometimes need um, objects to interact with that metaphysical uh, world. Um, and then <clears throat> another uh, aspect, talking about sort of the worlds of African man, woman, is the community. Um, and when you see this particular work, um, you should know that it is something that somebody would put their head under, uh, and then there would be a textile covering their body, um, and then the person um, would, and this is from Guinea, this is from the Baga people, would dance in what's called a masquerade. Um, and these masquerades have various different functions within uh, different um, African cultures. But in general, <clears throat> um, they sometimes show um, antisocial behavior. Um, and so they are uh, an educational, they're kind of in an educational realm. Um, and they also might be <clears throat> involved in um, uh, certain sorts of... Uh, uh, initiation ceremonies, uh, which we'll talk about a, a little bit later down the road. Um, and uh, yeah, so what's been interesting for me is over the last couple of years, a lot more museums are not just showing, in this case, uh, the helmet mask, um, but actually, hold on. Oh yeah, okay, so we're, we're good. Let's say. Um, so they are, will show, have a little, um, now with technology, they'll have a little screen and you see the actual masquerade being danced with the actual helmet. Um, I've seen that this at Mia actually. Um, so it kind of helps to contextualize it more. Um, and so there you go. Okay. Now, um, here's an interesting, I've always been fascinated by this. So within the Yoruba people who are part of Southwest Nigeria, there is a universal preoccupation um, with maternity. Um, and going back to that idea of making connections to the spiritual world, um, if a woman was to have twins and one of them died, then she would go to a diviner and she would have the diviner make a small sculpture. It's about, I don't know, maybe I'm very, I'm horrible with measurements, but six inches high. And the woman then would take that um, image of her dead baby and carry it around with her with the still alive baby. 
Um, and she would bathe it and give it cowrie shells and so on and so forth. And that's because she's trying to, I don't know if she's appeasing the spirit in the, of the dead baby in the spiritual world, um, but she's definitely linking to it by taking care of that sculpture. Um, and you can go into any major encyclopedic museum in the United States and see these uh, incredible figures from the Yoruba. And what's disturbing is I have a whole book on, on this tradition. Um, at some point, I would say in the 20th century, um, some companies started to make plastic dolls. Um, and uh, that's, that's just, uh, just is very disturbing. But um, so yes, so this is an example of an object that had a function that was connecting to the spiritual world that now today is under lights, under glass, and considered to be art. Okay, let's keep going. Oh, here they are. I forgot I put these in here. Oh my Lord. Yeah. So here they are. Here are the Caucasian white dolls. Um, boy, let's not spend too much time on that. That's just too much. Okay. Um, so, so not many people were really that interested in African art until the scramble for Africa in the late 1800s. And some of you might be familiar with this. Uh, so between 1854 and 1917, there was not a major conflict uh, between the major European powers. Um, and what happened was they sort of, um, in essence, put all their energy into conquering the world. Uh, this is the time period in which the British said that the British, uh, the sun never set on the British Empire. And all, obviously a lot of it was economics. They were looking for new markets. They were looking for new, um, they were looking for new, um, uh, I'll have to stop right there. <laughs> Sorry, I had a little, uh, I don't know what that was. They were looking for new resources, which of course the African continent is full of. Um, and, uh, so yeah, so the major powers, of course, that took control of Africa were England, France, uh, Portugal, that little country, Belgium, you know, was, uh, it used to be, be called the, uh, Belgian Congo before it became the Democratic Republic of the Congo, this huge space in Africa controlled by little Belgium. Um, and yeah, and the Spanish a little bit, but not really. Um, and so, uh, having, uh, actually gone out and, um, conquered some of these areas, there was more of an interest as we could imagine in the actual art, um, and objects that were coming out of there. So this is kind of fun. This is from Cameroon. This is the Dula people. And it's a major miniature boat with foreigners. And I've, I've always been fascinated by how various different cultures present the white conqueror um, in their art. Um, and this is a great example of it. Okay, so, oh, what happened? All right, so um, art is used to commiserate with the dead as well as part of rituals to control aspects of the unknown. So now we're going to that spiritual world again. Um, and this is from Angola and the Chakwa people. One of the um, aesthetics that I can recognize from the African continent are the Chakwa people. Their masks have these very um, sharp teeth. Um, and I, for some reason I can always uh, understand that it's an object from them. Um, if you became a PhD uh, in African art history, uh, like Ray Silverman, um, you would be able to tell right away which indigenous populations some of these objects came from. But we're not going to get that sophisticated at this point. Okay, uh, and then this is uh, what's called a power figure. Um, and this is from the Congo people, again, Democratic Republic of the Congo. Major museums always have one of these figures, and it's a very interesting object. So basically, um, 
in the middle there used to be a mirror and behind the mirror that little square there of his belly um they would have uh organic materials and uh, let's say that um uh you wanted to uh have uh luck um in uh your cow giving birth and so you would take metal um and you would um go through some sort of process or ritual in which you were asking uh the power figure uh to give you this uh great new calf and then you would pound it into the figure and the figure acts as a conduit to the spiritual world and then the spiritual world has an influence on the concrete reality world um and lo and behold um your cow actually gives birth to two calves um a little bit of nebraska scenario there um and at some point these power figures are seen to not be powerful and they're buried um so this could have been that situation but it's more than likely this was actually stolen by europeans um and uh some of the large i saw one in the detroit institute of arts it was huge um and uh anyways they're just they're just really interesting um again we would call them works of art they're sculptures uh but we're not called that um in their um other context okay um I thought it'd be kind of fun uh, to look at, uh, we're gonna have a homework on this actually, I'm gonna send to you guys on Thursday, on Ethiopian Christian art, um, because you get to see black Jesus and black angels and, and black um, followers of Jesus. And uh, so Ethiopia has a long history of Christianity going back to the sixth century. Um, and they have beautiful manuscripts as you're seeing here um and uh so not everything is um a lot of cultures in africa are, of course animists uh they um believe in part of their belief system is is in the power of animals and the sacrifice of animals let's just be honest um but there is there are of course examples of christian art and especially in northern africa of course there's uh uh, Islamic works of art, um, which we'll get to Islam later. Okay, uh, so this is another um, very popular type of object that you see in museums, um, and it is a reliquary figure. I'm kind of skipping over masquerades are for specific ancestors and collective ancestors okay so what what so copper has a power um in this particular case among the koto people um to ward off evil spirits from what we don't see below which would be a box of uh ancestor bones um and so ancestors are very important in a lot of traditional african cultures um and in this particular case uh the function of what we would consider to be a sculpture is is hugely important um and so that's and you see a lot of these it's just a really interesting um uh, object so a reliquary figure holds the remnants of the people the bones of a powerful person and copper wards off the spirits of the night okay uh so talking about chakwa there it is there's your um very very sharp teeth um and now i want to talk about a little bit more back to the community and how art is used for acculturation the way one learns to be a healthy person in a society um and uh so it's to bring men and women into the society it's to show them the proper behavior, which is reinforced by uh, depicting antisocial people comically. It reaffirms the roles of women. Uh, it allows for the venting of frustrations. And sometimes secret societies impose laws uh, with regard to witchcraft. So all of that could be wrapped up um, in these masks um, uh, that we're seeing. And um, one example would be 
um, when there is an initiation ceremony for men. So let's just say that Jeremy and I, Jeremy, the printmaking uh, uh, teacher, uh, took a group of boys uh, across 55 uh, near that bank, and we uh, held a uh, community there. We would have hopefully some tents. Um, and for a week, um, we would talk to the boys, um, the 11th and 12th graders, maybe more sort of like young men, um, and tell them how it is to be a male in society. I don't know if I'm a great example of that. But, um, and then we would, after a week, we would walk across 55, and the boys' mothers would perform this ritual in which they would sort of grab the boys and say, no, I don't want you to become a man. Uh, and then the boys or young men would go to the performance hall and during that week they would have carved probably took more than a week let's be honest uh they would carve masks and then in the performance hall in front of the whole community they would perform a dance with their mask and then um they would be essentially men um after that dance uh so there's also initiation ceremonies for women definitely and there's definitely mass for women uh but some of the majority of the mass that you see in an african gallery in a museum would be probably from initiation ceremonies with men okay we did that okay now um so so i promised that we would look at some uh hold on a second yes okay so here we go all right now um I wanted to talk a little bit, so I wanted to show you some examples of um, what we would call art by destination out of Africa, and we'll see more examples of it. Um, and, but I also wanted to tell you about um, a fairly well-known African um, art historian who came up with this idea of three currents in African art. And I've always thought it was really a great sort of way of looking at it. So he believes that there is a tradition inspired trend a modernist trend and a popular trend i'm going to talk about each one of those so a tradition inspired tr trend is when an artist is creating a work of art in 2020 um that you would have no idea that it's not from the 19th century, which is what a lot of traditional art in museums is, is from that time period, um, because the artist is linking with the traditions and aesthetic from their particular indigenous people. Um, and so in this case, uh, it's tricky. Uh, it is, well, yeah, let's just, just leave it at that. Now let's look at a modernist trend. This is Dr. Bruce Omprakpre, um, and this is his work called St. Paul, um, and this is a modernist trend. And this is my example of art by destination, because when he created this, I think it's kind of apolyptic, you guys. I think it's a multi-panel piece. When he made this work, uh, he was expecting it to be exhibited and considered to be a work of art. Um, so it's not art by metamorphosis. It's art by destination. Um, I mean, just take anybody, an example of anybody in my classroom who's a Viz kid. Um, I would suspect that some of the senior Viz kids uh, in the first semester and probably the second semester we're making works of arts and maybe saying to, them, to themselves, hey, this is probably going to be in my retrospective show. You guys don't call it retrospective. We used to call it retrospective in the past. Anyways, so they expected it to be uh, looked at in the gallery. Um, and uh, so it was always going to be art by destination. Now, so we've talked about two. We've talked about that tradition. And I'm not saying that Dr. Bruce isn't maybe calling upon some aesthetic from the traditions of his people um but i what i'm saying is is that when he started to make it he saw it as a work of art that's what i'm saying and ooh, this is beautiful 
Is this where? Where did this come from? Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm going off. I'm sort of. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm a little bit uh, going off the road here. Um, why don't I have this on my list? Hold on, guys. Oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, we were fine. Okay. So this is a print. It's really beautiful. And unfortunately, I don't have who made this. What am I thinking? I don't know. Anyways, so this artist, probably this is from the 60s or the 70s. This artist uh, was educated in a art school. Um, in their African country. Um, and uh, this piece was probably shown um, in a gallery in Africa. And now it's in a collection of a Western uh, museum. Um, so that's Art by Destination. Thumbs up. And then last but not least, popular trend. And this is something we never talk about in my class, this whole idea of tourist art. Um, and uh, that's why I like these three currents or trends uh, that Mudimbe talks about. And, you know, I've, when Jennifer and I were in Belize, we definitely, you know, uh, bought some, you know, quote unquote tourist art. Um, and, you know, that's a part of um, every country in the world's uh, artistic output. And, uh, it is different than, say, the modernist trend, where you have somebody steeped and educated in art making works for the gallery world, um, or um, somebody that is very much trying to make something traditional, um, um, uh, or call upon their traditional aesthetic uh, to create something. All right, boy, I, th I never knew this was gonna be 30 minutes. Probably because, it, you know, it's my favorite thing to talk about as far as non-Western art. Apologize for that. Okay, so we won't go over the African 250 until next week, which is fine because we can hit it next week. Um, all right, I hope you guys enjoyed this, and I hope that you uh, will use this idea of art by metamorphosis and art by destination when looking at non-Western art. But it doesn't necessarily always just have to be non-Western art. We'll talk about that later. Okay, thank you, Ray Silverman, for uh, uh, exposing me to your ideas. All right, bye, guys.